Have you ever wondered what games you should keep or you should lose? Find out here at Purdue's. Have you ever wondered what games you should sell or you should use? Find out here at Purdue's. Find out on our top 10 list what games you cannot miss. Don't forget to subscribe to Purdue's. I'm going to go through and show you how to play Carson City and all of the variants and abilities you can do with the big box edition. I will also do my best to point out anytime I'm showing you something from an expansion and the big box versus the base game. So when the game starts out, you're going to be setting up the three piece chit here, the round marker here. You will put a mine on four and 12, a ranch on three and 10, and the other buildings will be chosen randomly. On the board, you're going to roll two six-sided die, and the white die will be at the bottom, and the black die will be up this side, and you'll take them, whatever you roll, and you'll place it out. The first thing you will do, you will put the town center. You will put a red building tile surrounded by roads. In the upgrade, you will have these wooden bits that you can use in place of the tile or place it on the tile. In addition, you will put out all nine mountains by randomly rolling the dice and using the chart around it. And if you have the upgraded mountains that are wooden, you can either place them on the mountain or in place of the tile, however you choose. Each player will receive $15 in cash, one road, one revolver. Now this is an upgraded wooden component that came with the big box. Otherwise it'd be a chit. Start the game with three workers for the first round. and a bunch of building plats that you'll be using to purchase throughout the game. You also receive one scoring token that will be placed on zero to start the game out. There also will be seven characters that will be chosen for each game. I'm not gonna start off showing what the characters do. I'm gonna save that for another part of this. And I'm gonna start our journey here at the top at the worker placement part of the game. For a quick overview, what's going to happen is you will have a number of characters that will be out. Each player will choose one of the seven characters. This character will give you initiative, the turn order you'll be playing this round, and a power that you can utilize within the round, and also will tell you how much money you can keep over from round to round. As you can see, each one will have a different initiative number, a different power, and a different amount of money that you can keep. Once again, in a further section of this how to play, I will show you what each of these do. So the first thing, each of the four rounds of the game, you will choose a character. You will then either utilize the power immediately, or it may be a power that will be utilized during the turn. Then you will set the turn order based on the lowest number going first and the highest number going last. Turn order will be set and this top number right here between one and six. In the first round, each player will start off with three workers, and you will take turns placing the workers on the board to utilize the different sections. A unique part about Carson City, in most worker placement, only one person can go to each spot, and once somebody has gone, that place cannot be utilized by any other player. In Carson City, if you go where another worker is already stationed, Later on in the turn, after all of the worker placement selection, you'll be able to duel or fight for that location, with the winner being able to utilize a spot and the loser not being able to. I will discuss those rules later. For now, I'm going to go through every section of the board of the action selection and tell you what each one does. The first spot, there can be no duels. Everybody can go here, as many as you want. You can either pay $4 for a horse or receive $4. The horse is a variant and an upgrade in the big box and is different than what's in the base game. Here, you can take this three gun chit that will help you in duels. In this spot, you get three roads. This is the other spot where you get one road that as many people can go as possible. This spot is where we will buy buildings. At the bottom of the board, you'll see this area and it is quite large where you can buy all kinds of buildings and build the city of Carson City. If you wanted to build one of these spots, you would simply put your marker on a square on the board. Keep in mind, you can also buy mountains, you can buy empty spots, 
or you could buy buildings that just happen to be on the board. The only place you cannot take is the town center. For a spot, you will pay $1 for the spot and $1 for each occupied spot orthogonal or diagonal to it. In this example, if I wanted to buy this one, it cost me one, two, three, four dollars to buy that spot. If I wanted to buy this spot, it would cost me one for the spot, one for the mountain. That would be two. I don't pay extra for any empty plats. So once again, at this place, you would everybody would buy their land. This is very important because you do not receive money until we get here. All these actions will be done in order of this. So now you make sure you've budgeted your money properly and you're able to buy the plots of land that you want. Anytime you utilize a spot and you cannot or choose not to utilize it, you are not forced to. These additional spots will allow you to buy buildings. I'll go through what all the buildings do later, but the price is listed below it. Three, four, five, six, eight, ten, 10, and 12. When one is purchased, at the end of the round, they will all scoot down and become a cheaper price and a new tile will come out at the end. Now this spot will allow you to receive money. And this right here is where the spending of money for the round will almost always end. This gives you $2 for every plat that you have out on the board. This spot gives you $2 for every gun you have. And it does include the guns that you'd pick up temporarily. This one allows you to roll two six-sided die and you get whatever you roll. In this case, I rolled a three and a three, I would collect $6. In this case, I rolled a six and a six, I would get $12. And this represents kind of going to the bank and, and rolling the dice in Vegas and seeing what you're able to get. At this point, all the buildings will pay off. And this is where you will receive money. I will explain this in just a few minutes because every building is gonna work uniquely. And this will immediately become understandable when I explain what these buildings do. And this row right here is where you will receive victory points turned around. For every two plots of land that you own, you get one point. For every two guns, one point. For every building that you own, you get one point. In these last few slots, you can spend money to get victory points. Five, four, three, and two. And you can spend as much as you want. Keep in mind, this is gonna be the round marker. So in the next round, there will be no way for you to spend $2 for victory points. This is the cheapest it will ever be. This can be a highly contested spot. Same thing with round two, three, and four. So when you get to the fourth round, nobody will be able to buy victory points unless it's five. This is very important. If you look at your character, there was a maximum amount of money you can hold over from round to round. So if you had taken this guy, you could only hold $60 over from round to round. So you would lose anything over 60. But the game allows you, in denominations of 10, after we go through this, and it's the end of the round, you can spend $10 per victory point. So that's a way to dump your excess money so you just don't lose it. But in this case, if you would have had $6 left over, $6, then you obviously couldn't buy anything for 10, but you could save from round to round. If you had had $66, you could either give up the $6 and just waste it, or you could spend 10, decreasing your amount to 56 and getting a victory point at the most expensive price you'll ever pay in order to utilize that money. And that's how you activate a round of the game. I know I still haven't explained buildings yet, but I'd like to move into duels at this point. If two people have a worker on the same spot, they were able to duel for that position. And what they will do is they will spend any guns that they have. So you will count up the amount of guns that you have. Any guns you get from a building are permanent. The only gun that will be sent back at the end of the round is this chit that you take for utilizing that space. Now if you remember, I said you had three workers to use the first round. If I had not used two of my workers, let's say I only placed one and then I passed. And the reason why you would pass, because when you pass, you get to come down on turn order when you pass. So if I'm the first person to pass, I'll be the first person to choose characters in the next round. Also, the additional workers I did not spend are now points in a duel. So if I had these two left over, and let's say I had these three chits, or I had this chit and this, I would have one, two, three, four, five, six firepower in my fight. I would then get to roll a six-sided die, 
and I would add that to my account. So five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven would be how much firepower I have. If Green only had uh, no firepower and no people left over, he would have to roll this. So his would be five. So he, uh, my eleven over his five would beat him. He this guy would go home and he could utilize him against next round. And this guy would survive and I would get this spot and get to utilize it like normal. That's important because you'll be fighting over many spaces on the board. In addition, if you notice here, it says plus four, plus five, plus five. So every round, so when Red did not utilize his two workers, in the next round, he would get four more. So he'll have six people to place next round. Well, I told you that Green had used all of his, but this guy lost. So he's going to get this guy back plus the four, and he'll have five to utilize next turn. So red will have six, and green will have five in this example. One other thing about duels I'd like to point out is that you can steal income from their building. So if somebody gets a building that's getting a lot of money, you can place one of your workers, like I'll do here, onto green's property, and I can duel him for that spot. If I win the duel, I get half of the income of that building rounded down, and green would get the remainder of it. And it's very possible that more than one player can duel at one section and you would go through that entire dueling process. So not only can you duel for these spots, not only can you duel for property that's unclaimed on the board, but you can also go to somebody's building and try to duel them for the ability to rob them. And this really does work as a catch-up mechanic. If somebody's getting too far ahead, you also have people go there and they'll be dueling them for that great income property. So let me show you these buildings. So the first thing are these red buildings. These are called houses, and there are townhouses that can be built in the game. These do not do anything or produce any income, but they do influence other buildings. And when we're talking about houses or townhouses, we're referring to these. Now, if this was on the board, somebody can go here and claim the property underneath it. And if this building was generating income based on this townhouse, if it's owned by somebody, they will no longer be able to gen in generate income based on this building that's owned by somebody else. And that can be a great defense mechanism to kind of try to keep people in place. Otherwise, the houses and townhouses do not generate any income. The next building is these mines. And the mines want to be built with no roads. And if you can tell it down here in the corner, you get a free gun or revolver when you build one. Mines make money by being next to mountains. So what you do is you count the number of mountains, one, two, three, and the mine makes income based on how many mountains, three dollars per mountain. So let's say Red owned this property and was putting a mountain here. This mine would then generate nine dollars per round because one, two, three mountains, three dollars per mountain. The next one is the hotel. The hotel is always built on a road system. So if I was building a hotel, I would have to build it next to a road or have roads that will connect it. So when I place this down, as you can tell, the hotel always generates $6, but it counts as two houses. So if you have a building that's generating based on the number of houses next to it, this is a fantastic one to slap down next to it. It's not only going to get the $6, but it's going to count as two houses. So if I was to build something right here, be one, two, three houses will be connected to that. Then we have the church. You can never duel for the church because there's no fighting at church, but it's considered a house when calculating for drugstore, bank saloon, and the general store. The church allows the player to prevent other players from attacking. All your buildings directly adjacent to the church cannot be involved in a duel. So if you have a very high producing building, you want to slap this church down next to it to keep people from attacking you and stealing your income. The ranch is a unique tile because it does not need a road attached to it. You do get a free revolver when built and it does count as a house if you own it for many of the buildings. And the way you get money for this one is it does not, imagine a hermit living here. He doesn't want anybody living next to him. So if you were able to own a ranch here, you would get one, two, three, four points or dollars per round. So you want to stick a ranch out where nobody is. So if there was no mountain here, this would be a great location. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you would get eight dollars per round for this ranch because there is nothing 
around it. If something gets spilled, then the income will be reduced. Next is the drug store. And this must be built connected to the road system. And when you build it, you also must build a house. This drug store generates $3 per house next to it and per ranch owned by the players. Remember how I said this hotel it was counted as two buildings, this was one. So for the drug store, if you own a piece of property by it, you might want to put it here because you get three, six, nine dollars per round and you have to build a house next to it. So maybe you pop another house down next to it generating twelve dollars. So that's how the drug store is going to work. It wants to be by houses and if you owned a ranch it would go up and the ranch does not have to be near it. Next is the bank and the bank once again must be connected to the road system and when you build it you must build a house. The bank's going to give you three dollars per adjacent house like the drug store but it's going to give you an extra three dollars instead of for a ranch for each mine that you have. So that's kind of going to boost your income. So you can see the little hammer there instead of uh, the steer that the drugstore has. They're going to work kind of the same, but one gives you for mine and one gives you for a ranch. Next is the saloon. The saloon wants to be built on the road system. When you build it, you can see this icon, you have to build a house. But it gives you $5 per adjacent house. So it looks like the drugstore and the bank doesn't give anything for ranches or mines, just $5 per house that's next to it. So that can be very powerful in the right situation. Next, we have the blacksmith. He must be built on a road, also build a house. His income on the first round is $5, 10 on the second, 15 on the third, and 20 on the last round. So he gets more and more powerful just because the game progresses. Also, $5 per ranch. See that steer? That represents a ranch. So for $5 more for each ranch that you own. So it's going to be a very powerful building. And once again, the ranch does not have to be adjacent because the ranch you want really far away. The prison gives you two guns, must be built on a road, and then you have to build a house when you build the prison. The prison adds two firepower and can never be attacked. So if you need guns, build a prison. Now the station is probably the most unique tile in the game. And what this is going to give you is victory points at the end of the game. It's the only tile that does so. It must be built along a road which crosses the map, the entire map, in a straight line. It does not provide income but allows for victory points. At the end of the game, the station gives one victory point to its owner for every two house symbols in a city rounded down. This is also considered two houses. So it will immediately start off by giving you one victory point. And you can get this next to a drug store, a bank, saloon, general store. It also provides income for them because it counts as two houses. The school must be built on a road and then you must build three houses when you build this. If you're playing on the river side, it's only one school can be built on each side of the river. Does not provide any income, but it does allow the other buildings to score more. The general store must be built on a road. You build a house when you get it, and it gives you $3 per adjacent house, and $6 if the house is owned by you. So this one is unique that if it is owned by you, you actually make more money off of it. And it's the only house and the only building that gives you income for a house somebody else owns. The last building is the city hall. Nobody ever owns a city hall. It doesn't provide any income, but it is considered a house. As soon as it's drawn from the bag, the first player immediately places on the city on an unowned parcel without paying for it. If no parcels are available, you connect it to the road. So when you occupy this building, each building they own increases its profits by one level, with the exception of ranches and mines. If you ever lose ownership of it, because your, your guy will stay on there from round to round, then your buildings will decrease. So the city hall is a very unique building, and this is considered only for the expansion. Now I'd like to go over the characters with you. Each character is double-sided, having a different power on each side. Remember, at the beginning of each turn, you will choose a different character for each round. The Paperboy has a zero initiative. He gives you a power 
that you immediately pay $3 and you choose another character that's not the sheriff and you can utilize their power. At the end of the turn, you can keep $0. The variant allows you to immediately choose another character from the cards in play except for this sheriff. You apply the abilities of that new character usual, but you deduct $5 off that character's money limit. You count the zero value of this card to determine turn order. Cash limit is negative $5. The sheriff is first in initiative order. He gives you an extra white meeple who cannot be dueled. So you really want to space this to the guy you take. And he can keep $20 at the end of the round. His variant position. You're not allowed to attack any buildings or engage in a duel this round. For every lost duel, you receive three victory points. And you can keep 20 bucks. So you're not allowed to duel anybody. But if you lose, you're going to get to three victory points. The banker will be initiative two. He will immediately give you $9 and you keep 120 at the end of the round. Very simple to use. His variant sign is also an initiative two. Before the end of the round, you may purchase three, five, or seven victory points for three, 12, or 25. So you can buy victory points for this amount of money and the motion keep is 60. The grocer will be the third initiative order, keeping $60 at the end of the turn. When you take this, you can immediately take either $8 or at the end of the round, when it comes time, you can double the income of one of your buildings. She can be very, very powerful. The variant side is you receive $8 or one victory per point per house you own at the end of the round, not including ranches, hotels, churches, schools, or train stations. A townhouse earns you one victory point like a normal house, so the houses can be very powerful with the grocer. The Chinaman is a four initiative. You can keep $30 at another round. He gives you $50 off any buildings you buy this round and two roads immediately. His variant side, you take $5. You take one of the available buildings. You may build it immediately or keep it to be built later. The remaining buildings are shifted and a new one is drawn from the bag. So he gives you $5 in a new building and $30 would be the max. So the settler at number five and $30 in the round will give you a free parcel of land, but it has to be unowned. The other side gives you $8 immediately and you receive one victory point per mountain that you own. And he'll give you 20 bucks as the max you can keep at the end of the round. The captain is six in initiative order and he allows you to buy extra people for the round. So for one is $1, two is four, Three is nine, you can keep a max of 25 at the end of the round. He also, on the variant side, you pay $3 immediately to receive a revolver token, or $9 to receive two revolver tokens. The mercenary at number seven and 20 gives you three guns revolvers for the round. His variant is two revolvers for the round and a cash limit of 30. Now the Indian used to be a promo, he's included in the big box version, he's a number 8. You roll the dice twice and you get two random parcels of land depending on where the dice roll are. If something's already taken, you re-roll and he gives you $20 at the end of the round. The maximum price of any parcel of land for you if you take the variant side is $3. So you can get a lot of the land a lot cheaper later on in the game. Now, the remainder that I'm going to show you are all expansions that are included in the big box. You have the Prospector at number 9. He is going to give you $10 immediately. Then you select a mine from the available buildings or from the bag if it's not available. Then you can choose an unowned parcel that you, can co that you cover with one of your property tiles and you build the parcel. If there's no properties left or no mines left, you flip him over and you do the variant side. This gives you two pieces of dynamite. You will get these two dynamite. You can triple a mine's income one round. You may spin a dynamite token at any time when performing the estate income action. You can also place a dynamite token with a cowboy during the cowboy placement phase. In case of a duel, you roll two dice instead of one. Number 10 with a maximum money of 30 is the gunsmith. You immediately get two victory points with him for each duel that you win, including those against an outlaw. And the gunsmith's variant side, in the duels, you get a reroll if you so choose, and a free dynamite. 
With the Singer, you receive two No Dole tokens, and she'll come in at number 11 with a max of 15. So you can place these uh, with a cowboy when you choose one of the three actions. Either get three roads, get money at the bank, or to get victory points, and nobody can duel with you. Her variant side, uh, she may place a cowboy from the general reserve with a no duel tile on the gambling income space. During the third phase, the player ignores any duels if other cowboys are present in the space and rolls the dice for payout. So that can be a really good place for her to go with that variant. Auctioneer at number 12 and a max money of 30 will auction off two parcels of land. And if he isn't the top bidder, he gets the money. If he is a top bidder, he pays 50% of the price. On the variant side, he takes a three revolvers token and proceeds to auction off the ammos. Everybody can participate, and it's the same way as the other side works. The governor at 13, and a max of $50 in the round, he immediately gets one road. He receives one victory point each time he places a new road in the city, provided it reaches a new parcel of land. On the opposite side, there's a variant. If he chooses to tax weapons, he gets $1 from the other players for each revolver token. If he chooses to tax money, he gets $1 from all the players that each have $10. So he can take money and revolvers from other people. So here you have the Doctor and the Undertaker. So the Doctor plays a little bit differently. He's number 14 with a max of 60, where the Undertaker is 14 and a max of 90. So what the Doctor is going to allow you to do and when you take this, you can choose whatever side that you want to play. The doctor charges $3 to any person who wishes to reposition a defeated cowboy. So if you're out dueled, usually your guy would go back to you and you wouldn't be able to use him the next round. With this, you can pay $3 to the player that chose this, and if you lose a duel, you can place it somewhere else. Keep in mind the doctor pays nothing to heal his own person. With the undertaker, each player can choose to pay $2 the Undertaker or lose one victory point. The Undertaker immediately gains $2 from the central bank for each outlaw defeated during the current round. Number 15, the Cowboy, which looks a little bit like John Wayne, right? He immediately receives a new horse token. Max money he can keep is 20 bucks. Or the variant. When you choose the Cowboy, you immediately pay $8 and receive one ranch amongst the available buildings. Place one of your property markers on the board, and now you have a new ranch. Number 16, the heroes. Num uh, maximum money is 240 so if you're going to get a good money turn, you want to keep it, this is the guy to get. All your buildings are protected from enemy attacks, whether other players or outlaws. That can be very powerful. When moving the outlaws, consider the income of all your buildings to be zero. That'll make sense when I show you that variant. So here, you can choose one of three, receive three victory points, or put one of your available cowboys back in the general supply and get six victory points, or put two of them back and get nine victory points. This is gonna be very powerful and very quick to get some victory points if you're behind. Number 17 is the teacher, maximum amount of 60. Use the, cell, the yellow side on rounds one, two, three, and the red side on round four. You will be able to first player to choose a character the next turn, no matter what, when you pass the round. So she'll let you become first player next time. On the other side, you get two victory points for each school, prison, or church you own, and two victory points if you don't own any saloons, because the teacher would not like that. Number 18 is the lawyer on this side. He's uh, allowed you to keep 60 bucks at the end of the turn. You may immediately buy a parcel of land not owned by anybody else, and nobody can contest him from buying a parcel later on the turn. In the case of a duel with him, the challenging cowboy goes back to the personal reserve of the player before the duel is resolved. And that's just for buying piece, parcels of land. On the other side, you're going to have the editor. He publishes a story inspired by your success. At the end of the income phase, depending on what round it is, you win a victory point for every $5, $10, 15 or $20 of income from all of your buildings rounded up. So you can definitely get some extra victory points with this card if he is in play. One of the things you're gonna get is a variant called the New Beginning, and this is just pieces of paper. And this is always available to print out for free on BGG, but they give you a whole pad of these. 
And basically what it allows you to do is start out with $50 and one cowboy and you kind of buy what you want. You want more workers the first round? Great, you pay for them. You want more revolvers, roads, parcels of land, uh, victory point spots, you have uh, yellow or red side of the personality card, great service, after all players have chosen their personality, you may choose a second card, marks and who gets first player, and you just add up all your scores as long as it's not over 50, and that's your starting. So that's a really good way for people to kind of start out the game and not have the same setup every time. But this is for experienced players only. The other variant is the river. And you, on the flip side of this board, you will have the same setup exactly except there's a river going through it. Uh, with the Kickstarter, you also get these tiles so you can kind of set up your own river and it's gonna split up the board and it'll be utilized a little bit differently. One of the major, major differences with the river is that six mountains will be placed instead of nine. Two roads are necessary to cross the river. A river car parcel is considered a free parcel when calculating the ranches. So if you're looking at the ranch tiles, if a mine is in contact with the river, the mine is increased like th for $3. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to work just like a mountain. Any private parcels with a mountain building or houses adjacent to a bridge, which is the two rivers, or two roads over the river, earns you three victory points instead of two. There's also a variant called the Might is Right, and you're going to get a bunch of tiles, zero to five, six tiles, and instead of rolling a dice, you will play these strategically and then flip them over. In this case, I played a one, and that will replace the die. When, you're, when you use all six of them, then you pick them all up again. Otherwise, this has a little bit of strategy. I think you could play this with anybody if you want this instead of die roll. I don't think it needs to be just new players or, or experienced players. This one can be picked up with anybody. There's also a Kit Carson variant that allows you to place, play the game a little bit more simultaneously. So when you're placing the workers on the board, as soon as the first player goes, everybody can start placing their workers, you can move them how they want, and then you pass. So it makes the game a little bit more real time and placing of this. If somebody goes to a duel, you can be the one to move, and then when you pass, you're kind of stuck and you can't move anything else and people can still move things around. Uh, this is recommended only for very experienced players and people who might like that. I don't think most people who play this game probably play with this variant. I've only played with it once just to kind of see how it is. It's fun. It speeds things up a little bit. But the game's only four rounds anyway. It's not one that I'm truly happy with playing a lot. There is a variant to use these outlaws, which will use these outlaw cards, and you'll be using these black workers. They only come out in the second, third, and fourth round. So the first round, there will be none. So I rolled a three, you would add seven to that. In this case, I would have the 10 strength of the outlaws. You would take it, put it on the building income right here, and now that you know when the outlaws will attack. The number on the white die shows you how many outlaws will attack. In this case, there are two, which means only one will attack. And if you look at the chart here, you will see one to two, one comes out, three and four, two come out, and four, five, and six, three would come out. So since I rolled a two on the white die, only one outlaw would come out this turn. Then, when you get down here where the outlaws would come out, you'll roll both dice to determine where it's gonna come out. And once again, you're gonna look at the sheet here. So two white and four black tells me that he's gonna come out here. Uh, two white and four black. So he's gonna come out right there based on the dice at the top and the bottom. If it's adjacent to a prison or where an outlaw already is, then we roll the dice and go somewhere else. As soon as the outlaws are put on the board, they're gonna move one square. The person who's currently first in turn order decides in which order that the outlaws will move. So there's maximum on there, whoever's first person will decide that. So the outlaw will always move to whatever building gives it the most in income. So in this case, this would be a three, this would be a 12. So he would move to the outlaw because it provides the most income. Wherever the outlaw is, now if that hadn't been there, say he had come out down here, he would always move in the direction of the highest. So sometimes it'll be on empty parcel. Wherever he's at, it cannot be purchased. Any building with the outlaw will lose half its income. So if he got here, it's just 12. The red player would only receive six of his income. He does not affect anything adjacent to him. Now it is possible to fight an outlaw. So the red player may want to come here and try to get rid of that old nasty guy because he's only stealing half of his income. So the strength, if you want to duel him, is listed on the tile and it'll be different. 
In this case, it's three, and if you beat him, you're going to get those victory points. So you get four victory points. In this case, you have to beat a four, and you get four victory points if their power had been 11. If an outlaw ever makes it to a prison, he's immediately incarcerated, returned to the general reserve, and the owner of the prison receives number of victory points indicated on the outlaw tile. Now, the outlaw variant is going to add a lot of randomness to the game. I've played with this a few times. You can really get hosed on this if things aren't going well. It's always going to seek out whoever's in first. So this might be a good thing to add. If you got somebody who's really good at the game and he's playing against other people, this may be a way, the outlaws might be a way to kind of level the playing foot a little bit because he will always go to the house or building that's generating the most income. So that's something to think about. Now these player boards are an upgrade with the Kickstarter big box. So this is going to be a place to put your workers, your revolvers, you put your money, your guns, uh, your buildings that you're not buying, your parcel of land, your uh, roads, your character you got for the round. And this place down here is going to be where you're going to be utilizing the horses. And this is a variant that I do like to play with and I do include in most games. Now in the expansion you just get these little wooden or these little tokens and chits. But I like to place those aside because in the big box version, I got these wooden horses that look fantastic if you ask me. If you play with this variant, you're gonna start out with one horse, which you will just set right here. So there's two ways to get a horse. You can take the spot on the board that you pay $4, or the reverse variant side of the cowboy will give you additional horses. When you place a cowboy on the board, you also have the choice of placing your horse in one of these locations. In addition, you can always choose to place a cowboy in one of these locations. Anytime there's a cowboy in a location, it's going to double the value of the location. If you place a horse in the first location, you're going to get a gun. If you place three, you're going to get two guns. In the second enclosure, you immediately choose an extra cowboy from your reserve, move an already placed cowboy to another location, or pass, effectively ending your cowboy placement phase. The third one allows you to double the income of one of your ranches. And this is only the ranch if you have it out there. And this cannot be combined with the grocer to double it again. In this position, you get $2 immediately. The last one is going to help you and give you a plus five rodeo bonus when determining the winner of the rodeo. So let's talk about the rodeo. At the end of each round, there's going to be a rodeo. And each spot that you picked is going to give you a number of hats. Remember, if you place a cowboy here, it will double the amount of hats that you can get for that spot. Each player is going to count up how many points they got for their rodeo. Each horse, so if I put two here, I would get 10. If I put two here, I would get four instead of the normal two. So you're going to get the points for each horse that you put there. The highest rodeo score wins the Carson City Rodeo. You get a rodeo token that raises the value of each horse you own at the end of the game by one victory point. So normally they're worth one victory point, but each rodeo hat, each rodeo you get is going to make them more valuable because now they're more famous. At the end of your turn, you're going to remove all your horses from the enclosures and you'll be free to set them up again for the next turn. Thank you for watching my explanation of all the variants and everything that's included in the big box. Currently, this is everything you can have for Carson City and kind of how it works. If you have any additional questions or comments, please put them below. I'll be happy to either make a new video to answer some of those questions or just all comment below and answer those the best I can. Thanks for watching the video. I really appreciate you tuning in. If you liked it, please like it and hit that little subscribe button. That really helps out the channel. Let's us know that you're getting the videos that you want. If you agreed or disagree with what I said, feel free to comment below. I'd love to hear what you have to say, and I promise that I will comment back. Thanks for watching, and everybody else, keep playing games.